Ребята, добрый вечер. Спасибо, что вы дождались сегодняшний, наверное, такой длинный день у вас был. И вы дождались нашей презентации по образованию в Великобритании и в США. Сегодня у нас... Меня зовут Мария. Я бы хотела сначала представить себя и нашу команду. Я работаю в компании Inter University of Partnerships. И сегодня у нас есть гости из американских университетов. Suffolk University, Oregon State University and... Exeter University and into Manchester. И сегодня у нас будут небольшие презентации по обучению в этих вузах и э, как туда поступить, какие возможности, какие есть программы. Презентации будут на английском. Если у вас какие-то будут вопросы, то задавайте, не стесняйтесь. And the first presentation is Tim from Suffolk University. Tim? Just... You can say. Thanks, support crowd. Good afternoon. Thanks for coming today. Um, we're going to talk for about 10 to 15 minutes each. Um, as she mentioned, two of us are from the U.S., two of us are from the U.K. So you're going to get to see a little bit, um, both geographically and culturally, how we might be a little bit different, okay? If you have questions, because we're going to go through these presentations quite quickly and not cover all of our slides, because we don't want you to fall asleep in this auditorium. Um, we are going to be available for questions after as well, okay? So just very quickly, a little bit about Boston. I'm actually not going to play this video because we don't really have time to do that. But <clears throat> as far as location, Boston, Massachusetts is on the east coast of the United States here. And um, Boston is known as an education city. There are about 35 different universities in Boston alone. Boston is ranked as the number one stud student city in the United States. We have about 4 million people in Boston, and about 250,000 of that population are college students, and about 50,000 of those students are international students from all over the world. So lots and lots of people from 18 to 23 years old. You guys let me know how, how I'm doing on time, okay, when I've got a few minutes left. We are in the very center of Boston, so we're an urban campus, which means we don't have a large residential space, kind of like you do here. We're set in the very middle of the city, and then we own several of the buildings right in the heart of the city. So they're either dorms or your, your classrooms where you would go. So you're, you're really walking to everything while you're there in the heart of the city. This is the government side of the area or of the city, and this is the financial district of the city. So whether you are studying government policy or finance or marketing, you're really walking to all of these opportunities that you have outside of class for your internships. How, just out of a curiosity, how old is everyone here? Just so I know how old I'm, 15, 16, huh? How old? 15 to 17, okay. We have two campuses, one is in Boston and one is in Madrid. So all of you here, as a result of your age, you're going to be going towards a bachelor's degree, right? Your first degree in the United States. And as a result of that, for bachelor's students, we, we have two campuses. The first one is in Madrid, where you can start your first two years of your undergraduate coursework. You can learn in English, and then because you live in Spain, you would be speaking Spanish and learning Spanish. So if you're business students, um, you would be able to learn a third language before you end up coming to Boston and finishing your degree. Lots and lots of students come to Boston or choose Boston because of work opportunities after your degree. So just out of curiosity, again, can you tell me, just, but you don't have to raise your hand. Just tell me what you're interested in studying. Is it government, business, science? Economics, finance, marketing, what else? IT, okay. So all of these things that you're mentioning, it's going to be important where you study and what you study, right? What you choose to study right now, we're a little bit different um, Ashley and David will be able to talk a little bit, and Lucy will be able to talk a little bit about the differences of how work happens after the degree. But in the United States, choosing what you're going to study 
is very important because in the United States, once you get your degree, the United States gives you two different options for work, either one year or three years of work. So if you're planning on working in the U.S. after your degree, something that's going to be more and more important for you to start thinking about, and let me just kind of go through a couple of these slides before I get to that point. Lots and lots of sports. Do any of you watch American sports, American football, anything like that? Yeah, you guys do. So this is perhaps the most famous quarterback in the United States, Tom Brady. Um, my wife, that's her second boyfriend. And just the other day, she told me that she had a dream about him. And every once in a while, she tells me how cute he is and all these kind of things. But now she's starting to have dreams about him. And her dream was that they were best friends and they were just walking around the city together. So he's a great guy, but not that great. <laughs> Lots of food. So what I want to talk about is specifically because of the limited amount of time that we have is why you might want to choose one degree or over another. Okay. And what I want you to start thinking about as it relates to the United States is a STEM degree. Does anyone in here know what STEM stands for? Any guesses? It's an acronym for something. I'm not sure. What, that, what, what did you say? Work after graduation. It's related to work after graduation, right? STEM means science, technology, engineering, or math, okay? And in the U.S., if you're going to study a degree in the United States, if you study STEM, it's going to give you three years of work opportunity rather than one year of work opportunity. And usually, not always, but usually, the jobs are much higher paying, right? So you mentioned marketing and finance and things like that. Those are great degrees to, to learn. But what I'd like you to consider, too, is if you're going to go to the United States and study business, for example, we would recommend that you choose big data and analytics. Who knows what big data is? And how am I doing on time? Five minutes. Okay. Who knows what big data is? What is it? It's business related. Yes. Okay. Exactly. We commonly refer to that big place as the cloud, right? All of the, our information goes up into this big place. The Internet of Things. Exactly. So how many of you have social media on your phones? Probably most of you, right? How many, how many of you have Instagram? number of you. Have you ever noticed every fourth picture on Instagram? What is it? an advertisement. And have you ever noticed that those advertisements strongly relate to something that you're interested in? Okay. So who do you think, how do you think that that happens? They. Who's they? Hackers. Not exactly hackers, but that's possible. The people that look at that data are called business analysts or analysts, right? And they are going and getting all of that information in the cloud, and they're telling that business that might be interested in what you have been looking at that this person right now is interested in this product. It's a very effective way to get something that you might want to buy in front of you but it goes into sports, it goes into medicine, it goes into how products get from one place to another, right? And so the reason that I want you to start considering things like this is no longer in the United States is a general business degree going to be that helpful for you. You need to think about something specific. And for example, if you were to get a general business degree in the US, you would make about 40,000 US dollars per year. That's not bad, but if your bachelor's degree is going to cost you over 200000 it's not that great. 
right? Where a business analyst who studies nearly the same thing as someone who's doing general business, but knows how to access that data, makes about $80,000 per year. And then those business analysts can go on to specialize in marketing or finance or other fields, right? So what I want you to start thinking about, no matter where you're going to go or what university you're going to choose, if you are looking at universities in the US, try, if you can, to look for STEM opportunities, whether it's business or whether it's in the arts and sciences, like computer science, IT, or chemistry, or biology, medicine, things like that, okay? There's lots more that I would ordinarily talk about, but I wanna make sure that I give everyone a chance to speak and that you are engaged and that you're, this is meaningful for you. So I'll wrap it up right now if you have specific questions after about costs, about living, about advantages of Boston, things like that feel free to come up and ask, okay? Yeah, you have one question now? Yes, we do, yeah. So really quickly, uh, we have scholarships up to about $20,000 per year um, for undergraduate and graduate students. Our fees um, for total cost of living at the undergraduate level is about $60,000 per year. So you can bring that down to about $40,000 per year. Good question, and it's all based on your grades. <laughs> Price is about 60,000 US for everything, cost of living, education, everything, about $40,000 for fees before scholarship. Good question. Any other questions? Okay, sure. Now, uh, I would like to introduce Yelena, uh, Yelena from uh, Oregon State University. Yelena, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, guys. Um, mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, my name is Yelena, uh, Yelena Sepp, and uh, I'm originally from Russia, but I live and work in the United States uh, at Oregon State University. And originally, I'm from, um, uh, from the city that is very, very far from here, from Vladivostok. Um, and um, as I like saying uh, in Oregon, um, I'm from the other side of the Pacific Ocean. So, um, so Oregon State University is uh, in Oregon on the west side, uh, opposite from uh, team. Um, and we are between uh, Seattle and San Francisco, between Washington and um, California. Um, in the area that is now called um, Silicon Forest. So I, I'm sure you've heard the Silicon Valley expression, right? Um, have you heard that? Mm -hmm. So Silicon Valley is becoming small, smaller and smaller and smaller. There are so many companies there, so, so many um, things that are happening that they are running out of space. So they started moving a lot of their things into Oregon. And because Oregon has a lot of um, trees, a lot of lakes, a lot of rivers. So there is a nickname now for, for, um, for that, uh, the Silicon Forest. Um, so our university is very big. So we have um, um, about 30,000 students and, um, um, and we offer all kinds of majors. But today I'm going to be focusing more on STEM, um, STEM um, majors, uh, science, technology, engineering, math, and specifically on engineering uh, majors. Um, Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> so uh, a lot of people don't know who, what they want to become, right? Uh, you guys are still kind of, um, you have a general idea, but um, you know, uh, but you don't really know what specifically you want. So um, every year there is a report or there is a, a study that is done of analyzing what is going to be um, 
in demand uh, in terms of job opportunities. And as you can see, um, so health science jobs expected to triple coming, um, coming decade, data science and um, machine uh, learning, a fastest growing uh, growth in the engineering field, and all other uh, technology and science majors um, are going to be in a great demand in the next five to 10 years. So just kind of, uh, there is no sound here, just kind of gives you an, um, an idea what the campus is like. Um, our campus is very large. We have a uh, bus that goes from one side to, uh, to another, um, but students usually you know, don't take the, that bus. They bike, they um, get on skateboard, and they use other means of um, just a walk. Um, all right, I'm going to. This, this, is, this is just kind of a general information about our university, but for the sake of time, I'm just going to kind of, um, you know, run through that. Uh, and uh, this presentation is going to be available if you want um, um, more details about that, okay? All right. So our university focuses on research a lot, and uh, we have a lot of research projects uh, going on from health uh, to, of course, um, all engineering and science projects. So just recently, not long ago, um, o Oregon State University um, discovered a new color. Um, and it was done by accident. Um, and before it was announced, I didn't even know that, you know, you can, you can actually have a new color. Can you guess which color was? I'm just gonna... There is, there is one on the screen there. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's blue. And the uh, chemical, chemical name for that color is uh, Yinmin blue. Um, so, because you know that um, all color, Uh, so it turns out that uh, colors, they're crystals, okay? And, um, so, and that's how they are um, um, classified. So uh, when, okay, um, they, they are classified. So this new blue, yes, it's a new blue color, um, a new version of blue color um, is, has an official name or uh, like chemistry name, Yin Min, but now um, it, already after the patent was established uh, or assigned, um, it has, um, um, I would say, a common name that is called Blutiful. It's a Blutiful. Uh, all right, so why engineering? So in next uh, uh, five to 10 years, you could see, uh, again, World Economic Report um, put a study out what, uh, what majors, what jobs are going to be um, most popular in the next five, five, five to 10 years. And you can see number one is going to be data science and machine learning. Number two, automation and robotics engineer. Number three, chemical engineer. Then civil engineering and um, electrical engineering. So if you want to study, if you want to guarantee your um, you know, your employment, these are the majors to go with. So we, ha we have all different majors in engineering, engineering and uh, um, as you can see here, but again, I can answer more questions after that because I want to show you a pretty cool video uh, that, um, or, uh, about Oregon State Robotics Program. Um, Oregon State Robotics Program is number seven in the country right now, and um, it receives a lot of grants um, as they're making robots. And, um, and I'll show you the um, video very fast. I think it's after that. We've been working for a lot of years on understanding walking and running. We started with Atreus. Atreus really showed the, the base features that we wanted to show about legged locomotion. 
So Cassie is the newest bipedal robot out of our lab. We added a few motors for degrees of freedom, so that enables us to like, stand in place, sit down, crouch, squat. We've had to upgrade pretty much everything from Atreus to get the size down. We've had to build a lithium-ion battery pack. We looked around to having people build it for us, and the two markets for that really exist in electric vehicles and home backup power, and those are both just way too large for our applications. We did a lot of our own custom designs for Cassie because we didn't have access to off-the-shelf components that performed as well as we could make perform ourselves. We're doing something that no one really knows how to do yet. And by doing it, we're learning what's correct. We're learning what the right answers are. There are a lot of robots out there that will take one step and put one step in front of the other, but they take a huge amount of energy to do it, or any small disturbance. These robots that are just sort of demonstrations will fall over the scale. There's only a few robots that are even close to Cassie as far as being able to dynamically walk around. Having only two legs is a much more complicated problem that we don't fully understand yet as compared to four legs. You know, a biped, and you can think of a two-legged table, is not going to be very stable. So there's a lot you have to do there. You really have to move your feet around. If you think about any sort of disaster scenario where they say, do we have any robots that can go into this space? The answer is always not yet. Imagine you've got a fire in a building and the fire chief isn't really sure if somebody's still in the building. And they have to make a difficult decision about whether they're gonna send one of their firefighters in. Is this dangerous? If you have a robot that has the same capabilities as a person, you wouldn't think twice about sending that robot. So that's my guiding star, is putting this out into the world and making something actually useful. So if you come to Oregon State and you're going to see walking robot on campus, don't be surprised because um, the students are always testing uh, um, different robots. And, um, and just kind of briefly, I want to say that in summer, we are going to have um, a robotics um, summer camp for um, for youth, yes, for youth like you. And if you're interested, I have more information. So there's no, there won't be any English there. You, you will have an opportunity to work with the people you saw in the video and um, to work in the, in the same labs and, um, um, and contribute to uh, the world being uh, by creating new robots. Um, thank you so much. And I'm going to pass on uh, to the next presenter. Итак, следующий наш участник по презентациям – это University of Exeter, Люси. Hi, everyone. So, my name is Lucy, and I'm from Intu University of Exeter. So, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview today about Exeter and what it would be like to study in the UK. So, this is a map of the UK, and Exeter is right in the bottom along the south coast. So, I'm sure many of you may have heard of London before. Exeter is about two and a half hours by train from London down to Exeter. So, a bit about the university. The university is very well ranked, so it's currently in the top 150 in the world. We're the number one university in the southwest of England, and we're in the top 40 most international universities as well. And we're the 12th university in the UK. So here are a few photos of what it looks like in Exeter. So we're very lucky to be right by the coastline. So we've got really beautiful beaches, so lots of outdoor activities for students. And we generally have quite a nice climate as well. So lots of sunny days, so it means you can explore outdoors quite a lot. And then we also have a really lovely shopping centre, so all the branded shops that you might want, and a quayside with all the bars and restaurants. So a whole mixture in the city. And the city is currently ranked in the top 10 for overall student experience. So having that good student lifestyle in the city. I don't know if any of you are Harry Potter fans as well. Does anyone like Harry Potter? <laughs> so JK Rowling actually studied at the University of Exeter as well. So they say she got some of her inspiration for her books down the little side alleys of Exeter. 
So it's quite a small city. So the city is, has a population of 125,000, and students make up a proportion of about 20% of the city. And we're currently in the top 10 safest cities of England with the sixth best student social life. So here you can just see a breakdown of the students from the university. Um, the university last year had 23,600 students, uh, 5,000 of those were international. So still very much a UK university, but you might have lots of other Russian students around. You can see that last year there were 71 students from Russia at undergraduate level. So this is what the campus looks like. It's a really large campus, not quite as large as the American ones, but for a UK university it's very large and we have everything all on one campus for you. So as you can see, it's very green as well, lots of trees. At one point there was more trees than students, but we now have a few more students than trees. Um, on this next slide is just a little video. Hopefully that'll play. Just to show you a bit what the campus is like in Exeter. So hopefully one day you guys will get to come and see Exeter for yourself. But as you can see there, it's a very large campus with lots of green outdoor space. So the university has lots of really great rankings and lots of subjects that are ranked very highly depending on what you want to study. And there's also a really big focus on graduate employability after students leave the university. So you can see that last year, 95% of graduates were in further study or employment when they graduated from the University of Exeter. And here on the screen are just a few subjects that are ranked really highly in Exeter. So I'm just gonna focus a little bit on the business school. So I know you said earlier to Tim that a few of you might be interested in business when you finish here. So the University of Exeter Business School is really great for students. So we're currently seventh for accounting and finance, eighth for business management, and we currently have the number one business school in the UK for graduate outcomes. So again, where your students ended up six months after they studied, Exeter's business school was ranked the best across all UK universities. So there's lots of different subjects areas that you can study at Exeter Business School. So you can do that accounting and finance, business management, economics with a whole range and you can do lots of different specialisms. And all of our courses you can do with a work placement or industrial placement or study abroad opportunities. All of our business school has got lots of accreditations and memberships. So again, you can just see there and also a few companies that some of you might recognize where some students have ended up since they graduated from Exeter. So hopefully some of those might be familiar. So as I mentioned, employability is a really great thing for Exeter. So the university has really strong industry links. So when you're doing your business degrees, you can work with companies, you can go to different cities across the UK or internationally to different cities to work for a year or just an internship or just maybe a summer. So you can gain lots of experience whilst you're working with 
for studying at the University of Exeter. And then when you go to find a job afterwards, you've got that really great experience. Um, the University of Exeter has a really great career zone, so they help you throughout your whole time at Exeter to make sure you get all the necessary skills to be able to apply for those jobs or to know which jobs would be most applicable for you. So we've also got into University of Exeter, which is where I'm from, and we're based in the right in the heart of the University of Exeter campus. So we offer programs to separate from direct entry to the university. So you can do an international year one with us, which is when you have the first year of university with us and into, and then you progress into the university for your second year. So you can see here just the different courses that we have, but the International Foundation, again, you can do in accounting and finance, your business management, engineering, psychology, and those courses run into the second year of the university. So that's just another option rather than just going to direct entry. So obviously it depends on what grades that you might get when you finish at the university. So whether you go directly into the University of Exeter or come to into Exeter for one year, we have slightly lower entry requirements and more support. And then you progress to the university for your second year. So I go past that one. So just obviously that was quite an overview about Exeter, um, but just to kind of remember some key points about Exeter is that fact that we've got that really safe student city, but a good student balance for you all, that we're in the top 150 in the world. We're the 12th best university in the UK. Um, we've got really good progression from into into the University of Exeter and that number one business school. So for you students that are wanting to get those really great jobs afterwards, Exeter will be able to give you the real life experience to be able to then get those jobs afterwards. So has anyone got any questions about Exeter? <laughs> Perfect. So we'll now go over to Ashley and David about Manchester. Hi everybody, how are you? Good? Do I need this? Or can you hear me? You want the mic? Okay. So some quick introductions and we need our presentation. So while it's loading, we'll give you some quick introductions. So uh, my name is Ashley Veras and this is my colleague David Thompson and we work at Into Manchester. But before we talk to you, we're going to do something a little bit different from what you've sat through already. Is anyone here thinking about studying art at university? No? Or architecture? Or anything design based? Okay, so you're going to find this presentation really interesting. <laughs> Um, but we're going to talk to you a little bit about art and design. But before I do that, quick question for you. How many of you guys are going to complete the International Baccalaureate? Four, half the room. Okay. If you study an International Baccalaureate you can, and you want to study in the UK, so if you decide, I'm going to do the IB and then I want to study in the UK, you can go directly to year one of university, first year. But if you do your attestat here and you don't do an IB, you will normally need to do a foundation before you can go to university. And that's what we all provide. So we all provide foundations and year one programs. And this is something that you might find interesting if in the next couple of years, you change your mind and you decide that you want to study something that's a little bit more hands-on and creative. So if you decide to do something creative, you might want some of these skills. Cool. So we'll start off by telling you a little bit about Manchester School of Art. It's one of the oldest uh, schools of art in the UK, one of the most highly ranked. It's a really big, beautiful school. The university has around 40,000 students, so one of the largest universities in the UK. And the, the School of Art is one of the gems in the crown. It's a really big, beautiful, modern building. So why do people decide to study art? Well, it's not because they don't want to work hard, and it's not because they want to make pretty things all day, although they will definitely be making nice things throughout their studies in art. People choose to study art because actually there's some really high-paying careers associated with studying art. And I think sometimes when you are studying, you think that all of the money is to made, be, the place to make money is either engineering or sciences, or maybe business and finance. But people don't realize that there's actually quite a lot of money to be made in art and art related subjects. So if you want to go into a creative industry, this is the way that you get into a creative industry. 
And in order to get into a creative industry, you will need to do a foundation. So we offer a foundation in art and design, and this leads on to an undergraduate bachelor degree in art related subjects. So there's lots that you'll study in it, but basically you'll learn all the fundamental aspects of studying art. But in order to get onto the program, you need an art portfolio. So we're going to play you a really short video, and then we're going to do a quick activity, and then we're finished. And you guys can relax for the rest of your evening. So how do we make this play? Could you play it, please? Uh, it's a picture. Oh. Oh, oh no. It's a YouTube video. It should be a YouTube video. Okay. Well, I'm going to tell you. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what's going to go into your portfolio. So, in an art and design portfolio, you need six pieces of art. So, six images, and you will also need some kind of personal statement. So, those of you that want to go on to study the IB, we already know you're going to write a little bit of a personal statement to be able to study the IB. A little bit like that, you're going to write a, a personal statement to be able to come onto the art and design program. And in addition to your six pieces of art and your personal statement, you are going to be able to give some justification about what you want to study and why. So three of your pieces of work should be some kind of observational drawing. And the other pieces can be anything that you want. Okay, so you understand what you're looking for so far. So the idea is that you want to show your imagination, show your creativity, and also indicate what it is that you want to study and what your future passion is. And you're going to do some prep work in addition to what you study, so that way you can show some of the background work that went into your pieces of work. Yeah. Okay, so here we go. So you're going to include ideas about what shows your interest in your particular subject. You're going to show your passion about what you want to do next. You're going to indicate how you made it, but also what worked and what didn't work. And you're going to write your personal statement, which has no specific length, but basically should indicate why you want to study art, what you're hoping to do with it, and how you're going to change the world through what you do. And so just to get you thinking about this, we wanted you to look at some art and tell us what you think. But to do it, you should do it in pairs. So you're sat next to people. Yeah, you're already friends. Just do it with your friends. This is fine. And I, I don't know if you guys are friends, but you are now. You are now. This is like matchmaking. <laughs> OK, so here we go. This is the first one. So these are all examples of real student art that was submitted as part of a portfolio. So just take two minutes, take a look at these pictures, and see what you think. You want to be thinking, if you were in art school, would you be accepting the student? And why? What does their art show? You don't, you, don't, you don't need to read the text at this point. The text is an example of their personal statement they submitted. But if you look at the artwork, OK, at the back, you have to talk to each other to make this work. <laughs> OK. Okay, 30 more seconds. We need like a countdown clock. Dinna, 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 dinna. <laughs> okay, so what are your thoughts? What do you think? Anybody want to tell me what they think about this art? There's no right and no wrong answer. We're going to tell you if they got in or not. But besides that, Too beautiful. Okay. They are. They are. Okay. They are different. Right. And this is really important. So when a student prepares an art portfolio, and this is true for things, subjects like, if you want to study things like computer games design, computer animation and special effects, 
interior design, architecture, fine art, fashion design. All of those types of creative subjects will all rely on a portfolio. And you're right, it's really important that a portfolio shows a range of skills because they want to see that you don't have just one trick in your, you know, in your arsenal. So they want to see that you're something, there's something about you. Okay, what else? Any other comments? Anything you don't like? Okay, so similar use of colors, okay. In the second and third picture, anything else? Uh, why? Okay, so they're beautiful, but they're not special. <laughs> yeah, some, some yin li, so what was that, what's the color? Blutiful, they needed some blutiful. Okay, David, was the student accepted? Okay, so the student got in. They show a range of different skills. The idea is when you apply for this kind of program, they're not looking for a pub, they're not looking for money or Manet or Van Gogh or Picasso. They're not looking for a polished artist. They want somebody who's got some raw skill. So this student was accepted. Okay, next one. Next student. What do you think? Take a, take, a, take a little time to talk together. Okay, so she's from, she's from China. And she says that she studied at Beijing New Talent Academy, which is a high school. And that she has a lot of inspiration to draw. She draws while she listens to music. So, so the, and, in, and in a portfolio, you don't only have to create, you can also provide photographs. So if you're a photographer, you might, and you want to go into photography, you might provide your own work, your own photographs. So talk to each other, what do you think? No, you're not impressed in the front. Shaking the head. Okay, is there anything we like? Okay, go. What do we like? Top right? Top right? Yep. Okay, so you like the photograph in the top right, top, top left on your side, okay. Oh, the drawing on the top right, okay. And what do you like about the drawing in the top right? Yeah, it's good. Okay, it's well done. So, so she's clearly got some skill, right? She's got some skill. Okay, so she's inconsistent. So she's good at something. So the top, the top right is obviously a real still life. She's drawn something she's looking at. And the other drawings are probably not things she's actually seeing. Maybe they're things from her imagination. And so she's thinking about what something looks like instead of actually looking at it. And maybe that makes a difference. Okay, what do you think? Accept or reject? She wasn't accepted. Reject, accept? Hands up if reject. You guys are really mean, you know. Very harsh critics. No, okay, was she accepted or rejected? So she was rejected. Good judge. Good judge of skills. Okay. Next. You want to do another one? Yeah, all right. Okay, here we go. Here we go. I think it's a statue that she's sketching. In the top left, maybe mm-hmm. Okay, what do we like? Do we like anything? Like no, you like the beautiful whale? I like the beautiful whale as well. Okay, so we like the whale. 
Oh, you like the photo? Okay. I quite like the whale. All right. You like the photo? And what do you like about the photo? What do you like about the photo? Okay. Okay. Very cool. Anything else? In the front? I can see that look. You're not happy. You're saying, you're saying not good. Not good at all. On a scale of one to ten, what do you think? I, she, I'm, I'm, this is not my work, so you're not hurting my feelings. Three, okay, okay. Three and a half. Does anybody think more than a three and a half? No? Oh, Tim, I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so David? Rejected. Okay, why was it rejected though? Most importantly, it's not actually because the student isn't a great artist. Because sometimes if somebody wants to do an art foundation but they want to do fashion design after, they might not be great at all types of art. Because ultimately they don't want to go into that kind of art. This student was actually rejected because they didn't provide a personal statement. They haven't given any context of what these drawings are, what they mean to them, or how they were created. And the drawing on the top left and the top, the top left and the top right, the sketch work, they've rushed it. It's too quick. They've not taken the time. It's probably because they had a deadline tomorrow, and it was two o'clock in the morning, and they had all like the Coca-Cola and Red Bull that they could possibly drink, and were just trying to get the sketch work done really quickly. So my advice to you is if you think about doing any kind of design-based course where you need to submit a portfolio, don't leave, don't leave it until right before the deadline. Take your time and be organized and get your stuff finished well in advance so you're not rushed. Because you can see the, pho the, the photography work at the bottom and the whale drawing is actually pretty good. So she obviously has some, and it is a female student, she obviously has some skill. She just was clearly trying to hurry when you shouldn't hurry things. Okay. Is there another one after this? One, last one. one more. One more. Okay. Are you feeling loose? Are you ready? Okay. Okay. So there was a personal statement with this. We just haven't put it on the screen. And it includes interest in going into fashion design. Okay, so are you guys going to talk to each other about what you think? Okay, have you decided? Any comments about the portfolio? Anything good? She does want to be a fashion designer, that's true. Okay. I don't know about you guys, but some of these things kind of resemble what I did in my sketchbook when I was kind of growing up in my spare time, making drawing dresses or something. Okay, any other comments? What do you think? Do you like it? You don't like it? Okay, so you're saying it's very simple, but you think she was accepted. Okay, and why do you think she was accepted? Okay, so it's easy, but you could see that there's something beautiful in it. Okay, I think that there's some really good things that you can see in here. You can kind of see the piece of work as it's being created. So there's not just a picture of the completed piece of work, but there's a lot of sketches about idea generation, how you thought about something and how it materialized, and those being two different things. So what do we think in total? Accept or reject? Okay, hands up if reject. Ooh, hands up if accept. Okay, now you think it would be half, but sometimes we do presentations and people are not sure. They're sitting on the fence. They're not voting. So you're saying accept majority. Few of you reject. 
Okay, David? So she was accepted. And this student was accepted because they show the way an idea is generated. And actually, artists and students who study creative arts learn something really important that a lot of students are taught to forget, which is that when you do art, you know, and I'm sure you've done this, so you're doing artwork, you get halfway through and you go, oh no, this is terrible. And then what do you do with it? You crumple it up and you throw it away, right? And you think, oh, I failed. This is, this is a failure. This is a terrible idea. But actually, what art-related programs, creative subjects do, is they teach you that sometimes failure isn't a bad thing. You think something doesn't work for one project, but you keep it in your notebook, and maybe six months later or a year later when you do a different project, you might refer back. And something that was a failure for one thing might be a success for something else. And tutors really like that. So just to wrap up, David and I just wanted to say to you, thank you very much for your time. Think about creative industries. I know you guys are really focused on science and engineering and mathematics and studying business and doing conventional careers. But actually, there's a lot of joy and a lot of money and really a lot of success to be made in the creative industries too. So thank you very much for your time.